According to the ancient tales of Ulster, King Connor had three palaces at a place called Owen Macha. Well, this is Owen Macha, and massive traces of ancient settlements have been found on that hilltop over there, and on top of another hill over there, but no one's yet had a chance to look at the middle hill. Time team have got just three days. Are we going to find King Connor's third palace? Started then, Phil? Just a bit, Tony. <laughs> yeah. One of the main reasons for excavating here is that this area features in a famous collection of Irish stories called the Toyn. Yeah. Mick, I found this uh, this bit in the Toyn that says uh, Connor's household was very handsome. He had three houses: the Red Branch, the Twinkling Hoard, and the Ruddy Branch. Yeah. And this place is called Grave Row, the Red Branch. The Red... Yeah. So, yeah. are we going to find a palace here? Well, we're going to try and have a good good look for one. Um, there are marks on the air pictures here, aren't there? There are, yes. Which is why we've decided mm -hmm. to go for this. I mean, there's a couple of parallel lines, yep. which and look archaeological, don't they? They do, and they seem to be part of some big landscape feature that splits the whole Navan area yeah. north-south for a distance of maybe yeah. half a kilometre. Yeah. So um, it doesn't line up with any modern landscape features. It doesn't seem to be a road. It's not yeah. going anywhere in particular, so it, you know, it seems to be something ancient. These are the faint crop marks showing on the aerial pictures, which give us a good archaeological reason for digging here. They appear to be about 30 metres long and could be parallel ditches or possibly a palisaded entrance to a settlement. I mean, that rather implies a, a palace or something like yeah. that, doesn't it? I mean, I, I thought initially we perhaps ought to be up on the hill at the top there, but it's actually too sharp a feature, so, you know, they're not likely to be Yeah, it seems to be the, the slopes are too steep on either yeah, side. Yeah. But um, the, the area of Creeve Row extends beyond the, the hill itself into this uh, yeah. flat land where we're working Well, this out. is a much better platform here, isn't it, with, with this, uh, where we're opening the trench up now. And we're, as soon as we get that we door, can't be sure which period stories like the Toyn relate to, as they were passed down through the centuries by word of mouth before being written down for the first time around the 7th or 8th centuries AD. Well, Do you think it's just coincidence <clears throat> that this place is called Red Branch and that they've got the Red Branch in the Toyn? Well, it, it's obviously not coincidence. Uh, there's some connection. There's some connection, but how far back it would go, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't well, like well, to say. What, that's what we hope this trench will produce. What do you think? Yeah, some yes. romantic middle-aged monk might have thought, "Oh, well, this is likely to be the place where the red branch was, so we'll call it the red branch." I, th I, th I, th I think it's. I think it's very possible. Our field at Creve Row is situated here, in the middle of a massive late Bronze Age, early Iron Age landscape at Navan, just outside Armagh in Northern Ireland. And the discovery of the two big hilltop settlements, Hohys Fort and Navan Fort, which date from 1100 BC to 94 BC, have prompted speculation that these could be two of the palaces featured in the Toyn. So according to these stories, there was this ancient kingship place called Owen Macha. Yes. It was ruled over by King Connor. Mm -hmm who had this hero called Cuchulain. Yes, and ruled all of what is now Ulster, basically. And Cuchulain went around killing virtually everybody he could. Yes, uh, this collection of stories, the Toyn, uh, demonstrates the, the kind of cultural background of the people that lived here. It's the story of a gigantic cat from Connaught uh, by the followers of Queen Maeve, which I think is rather good. Uh, and the, it's an excuse for recounting all the doings of these two heroes and the, the ultimate victory of the, of the Ulsterman. So all this area around here is the, uh, the territory of Owen Macha. That's right. Well, this weekend should provide a great opportunity to explore some of the references in the Toyn. But is it realistic to try and find a palace site in just three days? The Time Team's approach will be simply to concentrate on the archaeology that's there, 
to look for features that might produce evidence of new settlements, but even if not, will fill in some of the gaps and tell us more about what was happening in this enormous ritual landscape. I was just looking at these two photographs over, mm. over here and there's something quite interesting showing up on these. There's Navan, yeah. this shows up on there quite yeah. well. There's Hockey's Fort, mm. but further west, can you see that circular field pattern there? Oh, just, yes. just there, with a dark line coming out, which might be a continuation of a circular enclosure, a bit like Hockey's Fort. You see oh, a yes, dark line coming out. Line like yeah, I was looking at this other photograph, the same area. That's oh, a lower level one. It is, yeah, it's a lot clearer. Look, you can see it quite dramatically oh, there, gosh, can't you? Oh, gosh, yes. And you can see that it's, you can see the shadows cast by the trees there from the low sun. So that looks as if that might be a bank in the field there. Casting a shadow that Does, way as well. That yeah. looks really rather promising, promising. actually, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, there is this reference to three, hill, three hills in the toy, so maybe... Yes, yeah, so everyone's sort of thinking that the third one's Creve Row in the middle of yeah. it. Maybe it's further out there. Yeah, so they're equidistant. The geophysics team will no doubt be delighted if we've got yet another site for them to deal with this weekend. In addition to surveying our field at Creve Row, they've been asked by Chris Lynn to do some work around Hoffy's Fort in the hope that we can learn more about some possible ditches which are showing up as crop marks and appear to be part of the defences of the settlement. Well, we this landscape. And, as if that wasn't okay. enough, on this photo we've got an enclosure right out here which is as far away from Hockey's Fort, the other side of Hockey's Fort, as Hockey's Fort is from Navan, so yeah, we've made yeah. the area sort of twice as big as we were. That's right. Do you know about that one, Chris? Is well, we, we know of it as a site, but um, we haven't seen any such, such good air photographic evidence. And right. um, certainly it's a site that uh, in the sort of research that's gone on, we've queried, yeah. know, what is this? Yes. It's, it's yeah. a place called um, Ballydoo. There's a, a Tamlacht place name near it, which suggests it might have ecclesiastical oh, right. connotations, but um, right. it'll be very old. Yeah. But, what's, um, what's, what's the tendency sort of for, I mean, Creve Row, is that a name that's likely to have been given to this area, bearing in mind the fact that the Knights of the Red Branch turn up on the toy, or is it like to be well, original name? Because it bothers well, me. Well, you, you would like to think that the name is a survival from the time oh, when the tales... Oh, hang on. Hang on. Right. Hang on. Oh, Phil, yeah, this is Mick. Over. It catches at a rather exciting moment. Over. Go on, then. What, what have you got to tell us? Got a teeth bully of axe. Get out, what a Neolithic axe. The best. It's all Neolithic, I told you, it's okay. all Neolithic. Yep. Come on, what's your reaction to that then? Super. We're, ju we're just looking at each other here, and, 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 and Chris has just said super over. <laughs> what sort of condition is it in? It's superbly ground. I mean, there's no evidence of the actual flaking left, and there's a a fairly substantial chunk missing out of the blade, so I guess that's why they threw it away. Over. The time team are clearly excited because this is an object which you just don't find every day. But this stone axe comes from the Neolithic period, which is at least a thousand years before the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age period we're interested in, the era when we think Connor's palaces may have existed. What's more, the axe was only found in the top soil here, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the feature we're investigating at Creve Row will turn out to be Neolithic in date. Nevertheless, the time team still feel it's a significant find. Why? People were able to sort of reinvest these monuments in each new age, each new generation, continue to re-sanctify them and do their own thing inside them. And it's only logical to presume that yeah. this sacred landscape had its origin in the Neolithic. Mm. It's the Neolithic, matter, I mean, the, yeah. in Wessex you get these huge <clears throat> Neolithic the sacred landscapes with everything we've got here, mm. basically. Yes. So, so the story been, could have been Celtic people moving into an earlier the, ritual. Yeah, and I, I don't think people uh, necessarily move in. I mean, you've got, if you, you've got a, a landscape that might be Neolithic and Bronze Age, which yes. goes on being used into the yes. Iron Age, goes on being used until... And then St. Patrick arrives. And then St. Uh, Patrick it's arrives. Still and, being used. Yeah, yes. and, and Armagh becomes the, the cathedral. And it's just a logical ritual, mm -hmm. um, ceremonial centre, yeah. yeah. I'm so jealous of Phil. I've always wanted to find a ground stone axe. Oh. Sometimes at first, I must admit, I find it difficult to be quite so enthusiastic about a lump of stone like this. Although once it's cleaned up and Victor's finished with it, it's easier to appreciate that it's a valuable piece of archaeological evidence. At the Navan Centre, which is our base for the weekend, the public can see an interpretation of the archaeology discovered here so far. In particular, the complicated sequence of occupation which has been discovered under the mound at Navan Fort. Here you can see the evidence for a whole series of large round houses which were built one after the other. 
These houses had large enclosures attached to the northern sides and they were approached by palisaded droveways. And they seem to have extended from about 350 BC uh, down to 94 BC. Could these Bronze Age and Iron Age houses have been the palaces of the kings of Ulster? Well, certainly some of the finds suggest that this was an important place during this time. That's the skull of a Barbary ape, which, which seems to have um, been brought to the site in the Iron Age. And um, it must have come from the Mediterranean and proves that the occupants of the site at that time were of such high prestige that they were getting gifts, in fact, fit for a king being brought from as far away as the Mediterranean lands. So all of these things were excavated from here and we're digging just across this hill here at Creve Row. This looks lovely soil to it's, me. It's very productive soil. Yeah. I mean, is, this is what limestone is. Limestone, yes. That, yeah. You would get a lot of that in this area. Like yeah. The country is just peppered with limestone. Right. Yeah, it's almost as if they've, they've gone for this area oh, because there's yes, it's good no land. Yes, no question they would have chosen this area deliberately because of the, the productive quality of the soil. Yeah. And then originally, like it would have been in the church hands, and the, any ground that was in church hands was always well looked after. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's good. Any yeah. road? Yeah, come and have a look at the yeah, other trench. It's very similar, actually. Yeah. In both of our trenches here, we found evidence of what appear to be parallel ditches, but at this stage, it's too early to say what they might be. Curiously, though, this second trench has started producing finds associated with metalworking. See, that's the bottom of the furnace, isn't it? Oh, one of these blooms. Yeah. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Yes, indeed. But we've got no idea of knowing the date of this, although, no. except presumably it's not recent, is it? It's not going to be in the last couple hundred years. Oh, God, no, I shouldn't have thought so. Yeah. No. And this bit with nobbles on yeah. it. So the mystery continues in our two trenches at Creve Row. While at Hoffy's Fort, which is the field on top of the hill in the distance, we now have a new excavation underway. It's to test our geophysics results. These show what might be the remains of a gateway linking the fort with another contemporary monument in this landscape, a Bronze Age sacrificial pool rather strangely named the King's Stables. Have you got anything out of this yet, you chaps? Anything no, coming nothing out? Come out at the moment. No, no flints or anything like that? No, we have one piece of flint, but it's a uh, natural flint at the moment has come out. Right, right. So we've obviously got to go... We've got, got, to, we've got to, I'm afraid, yeah, bash on into this. Get down there, yeah. The geophysics team have moved on and are now busy surveying the site at Ballydu that was spotted by Stuart, and they hope to have some results for us tomorrow. From the air, it's easy to see the C-shaped field hedge that seems to continue as an earthwork forming a possible enclosure like this. Is this our third palace settlement? Well, hopefully we'll find out tomorrow. But having chosen to work here as well, it does mean that we're now stretched between Balladu and Navan, over a mile away. Continuing with the, the two trenches at Creverow, right, yeah. Phil? It's a lot of work you're mounting up, but yeah. carry yeah. on. Yeah. He's just digging there, right? Oh, you? fair enough. Oh, yeah, 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 that's not, that's not work at all. Yeah. It's the end of day one, and as you can see, there's this vast amount of things which we could possibly do. Everyone seems really exhausted and a bit dispirited, quite honestly. I think it's something to do with the fact that this is a massive site. It's by far the biggest thing that time teams ever had to tackle. Just getting from over here to over there seems to take half the day. And so it's very difficult to know what everyone else is doing. And there's all these little bits of evidence which are like bits of a jigsaw that don't fit together. I think I'm going to suggest pretty soon that we have a bit of a breather and think about it tomorrow morning. There's this great bit in the toyn that says the men of Ulster were with Connor in Evanmacher one time drinking from a big vat it could hold a hundred measures of cold black drink enough to fill all the men for the whole evening at one sitting I think I'm going to suggest that we try a bit of that cold black drink see you after the break Day two, and the first excitement of the day comes from our new site at Ballydu, where the geophysics team have found clear evidence of a ditch which is following the line of the earthwork first spotted by Stuart. So in fact, basically our results are fitting in with the crop mark evidence and also completing the, the mm. circuit, we think, as well. 
And, uh, and this stuff here? Well, that's the... Is, very, that, very... is that this mound? It is this mound. Mean, it seems to me there's quite an obvious lump there yeah. as well. You see, on the end here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It almost looks like a ploughed out barrel or something yeah. like that, you know. I mean, I thought that was natural when we came in the field. Well, it might be. It may well be. be. But the thing is, it is situated right in the enclosure. Yeah, I think, indeed. you see, that the, the <coughs> possibility with this is that it might be the third site in this mm. line. Uh, My third palace. Well, it could be. I mean, yeah. it, even if it isn't, it's another yeah. part of this complex landscape. Uh, you know, it might be contemporary with Navan. I mean, it's, it could be. It could be another fort. It could be another enclosure of some sort. But this looks too important to, be, to just walk away from there. Well, it? it's, it's completely from... unexpected. I think. Where would we in. dig the trench? I mean, as a punter, I must say I would want to have a look and see what was on that little <laughs> knoll. Well, but you see, in terms of dating it, we might be better somewhere in the ditch where there's going to be stratified stuff down below, and that will give us the date it was built. If we could get a trench somewhere that combined the two. Yeah. That's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. But in a way, we need the resistance done first so that we can see you know, how that fits in. Hang on, yeah. I, I've got one as well. So if, if, uh, if this turned out, to, this could turn out to be the, the, the third hill, couldn't it? Let's try this so, yeah. one. Look, this, this oh, that's far too this complicated hill. for me. All well, right. it's nice and coloured though, you see. There's, there's Navan. Yeah. There's Creve Row that we, we're digging up. There's Hockey's Fort. Yeah. And there's this one. So maybe this is nothing and he's just called Red Branch because someone at some later date thought that it might be the Red Branch Hill, and those three that's, could actually be the hill. That's a possibility. There's nothing else quite like this round here. You know, it's not with, that we've picked one of a selection. The, the, next, the next sort of things are miles away. By using a different geophysical technique called resistivity, targeted on just one strip of the field, the geophysics team hoped to quickly produce a more detailed picture of the archaeology underground, which will help us put our trench in the best possible place. Robin, meanwhile, has gone to the Archbishop's Library in Armagh and is hoping to find the origins of some of the place names we're investigating this weekend. Oh, I see, yes. It's got this site of, uh, of Navan, basically. This is 1819, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yes, the ruins of Awan uh, uh, were visible in O'Flaherty's day and were spoken of by Colgan and by Camden, who corrupts the name. There is a townland near the Navan Hill, which is yet denominated Creve Row. That's the earliest reference I found to it being named as such, which in English letters expresses the very sound designated in the Irish characters, the Red Branch. And then he goes on, there is an adjoining townland called Trey, now that is what I think we're, we're, we're looking at uh, as far as Hockey's Fort is concerned. Uh, a mound which in form resembles this figure and is universally denominated the King's Stables. Oh, well, that's interesting. So they're referring to the mound as the King's Stables rather than the artificial pond which we're also looking at. Well, I suppose it is possible that a mistake could have been made by someone while drawing up a new map of this area and it would certainly explain how the sacrificial pool called the King's Stables got such a peculiar name. There are, in fact, two ritual pools in this landscape, the second being Loch Nashard, which is located here and is associated with Navan Fort. Amazingly, it still survives, despite the quarrying around it, and it was here that four bronze horns were found in the 1790s. This is a replica of one of them, and although it dates to the Iron Age, it clearly shows how sophisticated bronze working had become. As you can see, it's beautifully made, uh, two tapering cylinders of bronze, uh, carefully riveted together with a, a beautiful semicircular curve, and then this great um, sort of end piece decorated in the uh, sort of Celtic La Ten style, uh, also welded onto the end of the, of the, of the horn. Which is you feel it, it's wafer thin. Thin, isn't it? So, um, it's all been beaten out into yeah. a, a very, very thin sheet of bronze. Mm -hmm. And then this beautiful pattern so beaten been... into it. Using the same primitive technology, we thought it would be interesting to put on a demonstration to show the kind of effort and skill that would have gone into making something like this. However, Cormac, our bronze smith, has complicated matters somewhat by deciding that he'll only speak in Gaelic. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been... Uh-huh. Bull to machle, bull to What? Now yeah, hang on now. Cossor. Shin Cossor. Hammer. Ah, hammer. Uh, I was uh, going to say, okay. I think you understand me, but I don't seem to understand you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what are we making then? 
It's a disc. A disc. It's a disc, yeah. I guess for a good stick of luck in the shade. That's it. And shin. So basically, then we're making we're making this bit. Uh huh. So how how big is this going to be? Yeah, it's a So we're going to come. Well, it's got to be beaten yeah, out yeah. quite a lot yet. Yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of work. A lot of work. And that's been put in the in the furnace. Yeah, it's just in the stuff. It's not in the tin. What? Just lay it in, do you? Or work it down in amongst the embers. Just stick it down in amongst the embers. Yeah, and then plant them up. Plant them up. Oh, I don't know. Well, I assume you're just saying stick it down in amongst in. the embers. Uh -huh. yeah. And how, how would that take long to heat back up again? No, no, no. no. Not really. No. Pretty oh. immediate, is it? Yeah. Hey, maybe a few minutes. Hey? So that has stop. You can stop. And, oh, and, you can and stop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ever, <everless. Hey. laughs> You're a local chap. Uh, Do you understand what he says? Not <laughs> quite. Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> not all the time. Nah. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one who's in the dark about it, that's for sure. <laughs> Any road, let's see you beat out a bit more of it then. Cormac will spend the rest of today beating the metal to the right thickness and size, ready for the decoration to be added tomorrow. At our original site at Creve Row, life is not only quieter, but progress is faster. Trench 1 has nearly uncovered the bottom of the ditch and has started to produce important finds. Well, yeah, I mean, there's bone remains coming out. Oh, yeah, and really? We're also getting, I mean, very most interesting of all is this piece of pottery. Ooh. Yeah, it's, it's a club rim, um, coarse handmade. Um, sure. What sort of date do you reckon? For? Well, I mean, uh, conventionally we would probably put this at late Bronze Age um, as so well as the bone. So do you think this is domestic stuff? Well, this looks like domestic debris that, that's so found its way into the... the yeah, here. so that, I mean, yeah. the, the material has found its way in from a settlement close by. This is a reconstruction of that bit of pottery. It comes from a late Bronze Age cooking pot, but it's very different to the finds coming out of our second trench at Grieve Row. Yeah. There's another piece of pottery. It's just come out of this other one. Oh, um, it's a Very thin slightly wall. better made piece than the other bit, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's it's substantially later than that one, unfortunately. Oh, I would probably sort of mean that. Well, I mean, it, it, it could be averted rimware, which would mean that it's it's early medieval. This bit of medieval pottery would probably have come from a pot that looked like this, but it means that we now have two pots coming from parallel ditches, which come from periods almost two thousand years apart. So even though we started work here first, we still have a mystery on our hands at Creve Row. However, the geophysics team have extended their survey and have a theory about what might be happening. This is where you're digging now. These black marks are where the high readings came up and we put the trenches across there. But they reckon there might be an enclosure which comes round like that. And they're particularly interested in this circular structure here, which is about 12 metres across and could be well, either a, a ring ditch of a burial mound or a hut circle. We could perhaps put a trench across that, see if it's really there, see what it is. Well, so if, um, if, you, if you can get that measured here, out, on the, I'll leave you with the geophysics plot, mm -hmm. OK? We can't afford scissors. <laughs> the workload for the geophysics team this weekend is immense. While half of them have been concentrating on Creve Row, the rest have been hurrying to give us some resistance data for Ballydoo. We've survived the same area with the resistance. And I mean, the really exciting thing, we get, seem to be getting a second ditch inside. It's even clearer than the yes, first I, ditch, Yes, I, I mean, it, it is very clear on that. So, I mean, if we have got two ditches, that, that will be really good. So they've decided to put the trench at right angles to both of them. So we should get both ditches in the Well, trench. I hope we will. So with more geophysics information to guide us, our first trench gets underway at our new site, Ballydoo. Hopefully, this excavation will discover not only the ditches, but also dating evidence to prove that this could have been a Bronze Age or Iron Age palace site. Meanwhile, on the next hill along, at Hohe's Fort, our excavation has achieved everything it set out to do. Not only has it found evidence of the gateway linking Hohe's Fort with the King's stables, but we've also started to find bits of late Bronze Age pottery. This is our first bit then, is it? Yes, that's Brilliant. the first piece there. Oh, wow. That pottery is dating to about 1100 yeah. BC. That's the typical that bucket ship course brilliant. pottery from here. Brilliant. This piece comes from the rim of a pot which would have looked like this and confirms that the gateway is late Bronze Age in date and contemporary with Hoffi's Fort. 
Here we have this sort of uh, coarse metal surface. Yeah. Think some sort of walkway. That's what we were saying earlier on. And, uh, and I, I, yeah, I mean, that looks very, very good now, doesn't it? Yes, uh -huh. and this with the ditch starting to terminate here. Yeah. And we are picking up something else in the corner here until that is and, removed. And you got natural again on the other side. Yes, with the possible elements of a uh, small stake hole post hole came up. And we haven't that fully excavated there, but right. we'll see that this year's delineating the walkway itself in the trench. That's brilliant. This will be great news for Chris, because the discovery of a gateway here in the middle ditch of Hoffi's Fort strengthens the idea of a connection with the sacrificial pool at the King's Stables. So you reckon there would have been people standing around here and lobbing stuff? Yeah, well, I think it. if you're going to make an offering, you want to make a bit of a splash and, and call attention to the, the fact that this is what you're doing. So How do we know this is Bronze Age, though, Chris? Well, we know because um, 20 years ago we had an opportunity to do a little trial trench just on the edge of it. Right. And um, uh, we found Bronze Age sword moulds, uh, <laughs> fragments of uh, red deer <laughs> antlers, uh, masses of chopped twigs, the yeah. facial part of a human skull, cool. and the four quarters of a dog, which had evidently been thrown in intact. And you know, this, this is a little trench, which yeah. is only really uh, yeah. about 1% of, the, of yeah. the whole area of the monument. Uh, we also got... Um, charcoal from a, a little cross section through the bank around the edge of the thing right, right. and um, that again dated to about a thousand BC yeah. so you know every, everything tied up very very neatly indeed. So it suggests the hole and the bank are being built yeah. around about And that you get the same yeah. conjunction of water and fire That's right. uh, that you get at Navan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if, uh, if we're right and we've got a little exit to oh, his fort yeah, here, fort. Yeah. Uh, leading down to this pool, it really ties the fort in mm. with the, the yeah. pool. You well, can imagine these processions. So now, not only can Victor recreate a picture of how this sacrificial pool might have looked around 1100 BC, but he can also add a reconstruction of how one of the gateways could have looked to the people in the Bronze Age as they passed through it on their way from Hoffi's Fort to the King's Stables at the bottom of the hill. Meanwhile, at our new site, Ballydo, Stuart is excited about a discovery he's made while surveying the existing field boundary. Yeah. It gets narrower at the bottom. Is this all stuff the farmers hoiked out of the ah, fields, presumably, yeah. well, isn't it? This is really what I want you to look at before I get any further. Have you seen on this boulder here? Oh, crikey. Have you seen this very right sweeping curve coming to a right yeah. angle? Yeah. It's, it's mirrored by this one here. And it's been broken off here. It has, yes. How do you think about it, it as prehistoric rock art? I mean... It, it, it is a carved stone. It's a carved yes, stone, yes, isn't it? Yes. I mean, that, that is There's incredible, no isn't doubt. it? I think. It is. I mean, you're happy with it being a carved oh, stone. Oh, yes, yes. No doubt about that. It's not, it's not a Christian a symbol of, of any description, is it? Not, not you know, at, at first glance. No, yeah. it doesn't remind me of anything at all. It's prehistoric, it, isn't it? That, that's, in, that's incredible. It's a lovely it's Significant, though, Chris, or what, no, it, what, it, what do we do? It must be significant, but... Um, I mean, are we, in, are we looking at a stone which is directly associated with the site? Yeah. Or is it an, an older stone which the, the builders of this happen to in, incorporate in yeah. it? Yeah. Well, can, I, can, I give it you my, can I give you my Right, opinion? okay. You see all this stone that we're standing on mm -hmm. just here? Yeah. It, it, it just occurs here in a swathe. Yeah. And I wondered if it's been ploughed, the farmer's got rid of it because he's been ploughing this field. He's ploughing into something it. up here, perhaps. Yeah, something yeah. just some, over there. Some mon stone monument yeah, like, or yeah, building. Like a stone yeah. monument or a cairn, mm -hmm. a burial mound, perhaps. He's yeah. just dumped it in the ditch. You, I mean, it's a silly question, uh, Stuart, but presumably you've looked through the rest, have you? Well, this was the first thing I got to, and I got so, so excited <laughs> yeah, about yeah. it. That, I mean, really... This is the location of Stuart Stone, and it's an indication that this could be a really ancient site. But as the end of the day approaches, we've yet further developments as a piece of metal is discovered in our trench here at Ballydo. What might be the stone wall or stone yeah. revetting, isn't it? I mean, it looks as if this might be a, a stone wall of a clay bank at the moment. It's curved. You see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you can even sort of, you know, goes in like that. Yeah. Can you clean that up a bit more so we can I was see? Like, yeah. Um, I mean, you don't want to take anything just, out, do you? I just I want, I want to be very, very is, careful. I is, is that a bit more of it there? This is clearly a job which will have to be left till tomorrow. All we have time to do now is to take a look at the latest refined geophysics results for Ballydo, which seem to show evidence of buildings here. I mean, there seems to be almost a hexagonal shaped feature there. Yeah. We, we need to do some more processing. Yeah. I'll yeah. sort of 
highlighted on there for those that don't believe what we're pointing <laughs> out. This hexagonal shape indicates that what we're unearthing here might be a later settlement. And if that's the case, then I've got to hope that tomorrow we can find an Iron Age palace underneath. A lot of features. Mm -hmm. And if we, you know, we were talking earlier about some sort of ecclesiastical or mm -hmm. religious complex, perhaps yep. early Christian, then, you know, that sort of noise would probably fit with mm -hmm. monastic enclosure or something like that. Usually a massive activity around even buildings changing site, yeah, things overlapping right. and right. ditches, paved areas, graves, anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's, an, it's another high-status site in a landscape full of high status sites of different dates, so it the, rather, uh, yeah. rather fills in the, the story, doesn't it? And convinces... I was going to say, you're after yeah. being the king's residence. Yeah. <laughs> but it does show you that the Irish loved finding bumps and doing things on top of them, doesn't it? <laughs> Shall we go, then? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So, end well of day like two, that. and the finish of what's been a fantastic day. Still a lot to do tomorrow, but everybody seems really up, and only too keen to join Tommy McCree for a Cayley at his house, to celebrate progress so far. I think we're going to be here for a few hours yet. See you after the break. Slanisha. Day three. And while Cormac prepares his furnace for a final day's bronze working, out at our original site, Creve Row, there have been a few developments to catch up on. Firstly, the news that both of the ditches are now thought to be of the same date. This ditch is essentially Bronze Age or earlier, like the one parallel to it. But we got confused at one time and thought it was medieval because we were pulling out medieval finds when the dig got down to about here. And the reason is because of all this black stuff. What happened was that the medieval people dug a little pit or whatever and appeared to have chucked their waste stuff in here, which was why we were getting medieval finds out. But when we dug lower, we found the bottom edge of this medieval pit and then the old ditch continued. So the ditch itself is very, very old and we were just confused by this little black curve here. So that's that mystery solved. But it now seems we have a new problem, which stems from the fact that we have two sets of geophysics results. One which shows two so-called linear ditches continuing to the bottom of this field, and another which shows one ditch curving off around a possible settlement area. A decision has to be made quickly to work out how many trenches we need to dig here to sort this out. But we have disagreement in the camp. I take John's point, but I suppose on, on a broader scale, if, if I was going to sort of dig this area, I'd say, you know, you put one over the core settlement and maybe put one over... Well, when we know that their ditch is clearly on the magnetic block. This is, this is block. dissent in the geophysics team. It is. It team, is. You know? We don't very often get no, this, what do we're we? trying to do is yeah. save the archaeologist's work. One trench here on yeah. this putative settlement will solve the question. The geophysics is clear. We've got two ditches running across the field. The only difference is the fill of the ditch at this point is different. We think it's different because you've got settlement at this point. Yeah. Okay. So why put a, a trench down there? Chris! <laughs> Can we borrow you for a minute? I mean, this well, if we carry on like this, we won't have time to dig any trenches at all. What does Chris Lynn think? Yeah, well, see. well, yeah, I'm happy that it's the same ditches. Yeah, and, I mean, there's no doubt it's the same here, ditches, there'll be the same it? up there. But were yeah. we just digging a trench across there to confirm that they were the same ditches? But it's clear on the geophysics, mate. Mm. Well, are you happy with that? Yes, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> I mean, again, it's the logistics of the, of the last day. So at last, our third trench at Creve Row gets underway to investigate the area geophysics believe might contain evidence of a settlement. Meanwhile, at our new site, Ballydo, work has started to excavate the mystery metal object. What's, what's, what is it? What's going on? Well, Some sort is. of metal yeah. iron plate. Oh, I see, yes. yes Not good. sure it is actually. Yes. Yes. What we've got to do is we've got to clear away 
all the spoil around yes, it okay. and we want to see whether or not it's actually sitting on top of the stones if it's sitting on top of the yes. stones it could be quite recent and just moved its way down yes, but if it's I actually see. buried yes. in the stones that's a lot more significant it could indicate then um, there's something quite ancient yeah. oh uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's slow delicate work which means we'll have to wait a while before we know what this item is but meanwhile we have another find in this trench well, you got something interesting yep very interesting Oh wow, here. What is it, do you know? Hmm? It looks like lignite. Lignite? Yep. What's, uh, what's lignite when I said, oh, we don't get that round where I come from? Well, it's a sort of a halfway house. Um, it's almost a coal type <laughs> yeah? uh, stone. Yeah? It was used quite a bit in the early Christian period yeah? in Ireland for bracelets and rings and that type of thing. It would appear that this is. Uh, and you got a, I mean, it, it, it occurs naturally round here, does it? Uh, yes. Right. Does this stuff need conserving or does it. Um, no, no. It's, 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 it's perfectly robust on its own, yes, right? Is yes, it? it's okay. That's good. Back at the Navan Centre, Cormac is making good progress too. He's thinned out the bronze to the right size and can now prepare to add the Laten design. The discovery of our broken lignite bracelet in a good stratified context means that we can now date our settlement at Ballydoo. This is a bracelet which we know would have been worn around 800 to 1200 AD. So this changes everything. It looks like we've got an early Christian site at Ballydoo. But I don't mind giving up the idea of a palace here if what we're finding is equally as exciting. And it is, because apparently it's very rare to find an early Christian settlement outside of Armagh, and even rarer to find one we can excavate because it doesn't have a church or graveyard on top of it. So we must press on here and learn more about it and hurry with our second trench, which is targeted at investigating the hexagonal feature discovered by geophysics. Meanwhile, at Creve Row, our original site, we may have a Bronze Age settlement after all. Well, it's a bit unclear, that was quite a nice line coming down. Like that. Mm -hmm. And then... Oh. That's... That looks a bit post post holy, doesn't it? Because, yeah. That, that yeah, we've still got the edge of... This feature coming through. back here, yeah, so we've got a line coming along sort of like that. A possible post hole. Ah, I wonder if that might be another one. Another post hole in that case where the edge wavers a bit there. So once again, last minute excitement and a race against the clock on the final day. Yeah. But back at Ballydo, our early Christian site, the metal object has been revealed and it's a horse spur and dates to the medieval period, about 1500 to 1600 AD. It doesn't help with the dating of this site, but it's nonetheless a nice find and makes a change from the usual bits of pot. Meanwhile, our second trench at Bally Do is progressing nicely, despite the occasional interruption. A little bracelet down in the other trench. Um, has this anything to do with an oven fort? Well, that's what we thought, that's why we came here to dig and then all of a sudden it's, it's a later site, it's, a, it's an early Christian site. And my friend wants to be an archaeologist uh, <laughs> and from, from Katie. No, yeah, Claire Murphy. Could you have any ideas for the giver? Just to make sure you like muck. <laughs> muck, muck and worms. If you, if, you can, if you can stand the worms, you're okay. I like worms. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could certainly do with some help because there's still lots to do. Phil's in a hurry to help with the recovery of the rock art because he thinks he's got to go and help Carenza with the excavation of the post holes. But the latest news from Creve Row isn't good. Um, well, we had this sort of... This is supposed to be where this hut circle was. We had this no sign of the hut circle at all. Um, we have this long linear feature coming through that. We reckon it's a lazy bed. That's where they were digging for their taters, isn't it? Yes. We haven't even found any potatoes. Um, the post holes that you were sent over to help us with, as you can see, they only go down an inch. But well, you reckon where the stones ripped out I or something? I think so, there, yes. Yeah, quite. And we've had no finds out of it apart from the odd bit well, of Well, this is terrible news. No palace at Creve Row either. But on a more positive note, Cormac has just about finished the decorative disc. 
It's taken two days solid hard work just to make one piece of the Iron Age horn. So considering the time and effort that would have gone into making the complete bronze instrument, it seems hard to believe that people could then have thrown it into a pond as a sacrifice. This disc, once it's polished up, will go on display here at the centre. But as the end of the day approaches, it's time to review the archaeology discovered this weekend, beginning with our original site at Creve Row. So all that massive debate this morning about where we should dig the trenches... I think we took the wrong option. We had five <laughs> options, and the one we took has taken us really no further forward. We haven't proved there was any settlement. The pottery that came, the domestic pottery we had that came out of that trench has come from sort of one small feature in the trench that's later than the ditch. And remind we me again what was in the one trench that we dug today? <laughs> <laughs> potato trench, a potato. It's great, it's potato very bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My sort of archaeology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't my idea. I shouldn't really have a go at Carenza because this was one trench we had to dig. It could have been evidence for Connor's palace. And we do have a real success here at Creve Row in Trench 1. It's given us the dating evidence, which tells us that these ditches are contemporary with the other major monuments in this ritual landscape. And it's what? Yeah, you it's can that... see that dark patch just there. So it was already well, beginning to silt up by yeah, the time... Yeah, it was silted up at least to here, and possibly because it's this lens shape, it looks as if it may have been cut into the ditch when it's silted up to perhaps that sort of level. So and then cut into that. Sort of thing, Chris, but we got no, no pottery at all out no. of any of the rest of this, which is the same, in fact, as that ditch, where we've had no Bronze yeah. Age pottery out of it. Mm -hmm. So they're looking very similar, except in the history of what happened to them after they were dug. Yeah. But I mean, this, this, is, this is great for us because um, this, this double ditch feature could have been relatively modern. Yeah. Un oh, un yeah. Until until just yesterday and today. Yeah. So I keep uh, hearing these words, double ditch feature. Can we be a bit braver about what that might mean? I mean, are we talking about a road with a ditch on each side or a fortification or what? I, I think more likely um, a, a sort of so-called linear earthwork with, uh, say, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll say a, a bank. It's a landscape feature going across the yeah. landscape, in, probably enclosing an area, maybe separating off Navan from this part of the landscape, maybe going around this boggy yeah. area where King's Stables is. It's some sort of a big feature designed to mark up, divide up the landscape or enclose it or maybe even keep people out of bits of it. Yeah. it that, that's what we mean by it. And it's a double ditch feature because it's got two ditches. Thanks to the geophysics work here, we know that these double ditches stretched across this field and beyond, although more work will be needed to find out where they stop. This is Victor's reconstruction of the double ditches, based on the few other examples of this type of earthwork in Northern Ireland. Originally, it would have had a slight bank in between, but it's likely that at Creve Row this has been ploughed away. At our second site, Hohe's Fort, the work here today has revealed more post holes, which run in a line alongside the metal walkway. But our work here this weekend has been an evaluation exercise, and now that the gateway has been discovered, a longer and fuller excavation will be planned for later in the year. But what can we say about our early Christian site at Balidu? Well, our first trench here discovered the evidence for the bank and ditch which would have enclosed the settlement. It also produced nice finds like this medieval spur, which once would have looked like this. And of course, our dating evidence, our lignite bracelet, came from this excavation too. But what about the other trench dug here today? Why didn't we dig this middle bit? Well, because the GFS boys, they saw something else. Yeah. And so we thought we'd home in on that. Yeah. And it appeared to be a hexagonal sort of building. And what we did was we just put a trench across it and we've got part of the wall here. But the interesting feature of this is that there's a lot of occupation soil um, just on the, on the outside of it. And from this we got a, a blue glass bead. This, 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 That's this, the this. bead. Isn't that wonderful? It kind of beats things like little bits of pottery, doesn't it? You suddenly get 
an impression of a, a real human being wearing something well, that's like locally this. made again is it again six well 600 there and about 900 or thereabouts ties in well with the lignite drop so, that at your pedal yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you describe what we found well, I think you found um, what seems to be the, the, the edge of, of a very large and very significant uh, early Christian period running into the medieval period site. I mean, it's 110 metres in diameter, and I mean, that, that is absolutely enormous compared to the, uh, the usual ring force of the period, which are sort of 30 to 40 metres. So, I mean, it is a site of, of um, you know, immense prestige. So it could be a palace, but it certainly doesn't belong to Connor. You know, certainly not, it doesn't belong to Connor, although I'm sure that tales about Connor were current and were told in, in a place like this, whether it was ecclesiastical or, or secular at this time. The settlement we found evidence for could, of course, be secular. But given its position in an area of religious significance, we feel it's more likely to have been a monastic enclosure. This, then, is Victor's reconstruction based on the archaeology and geophysical evidence, informed by a knowledge of other sites of this date. Of course, there's still masses of work to be done here, as there is all across this huge ritual landscape. I, for one, would love to know what's under the mound in this field. And I'm sure Stuart and Victor would like to know where the rock carving originated from. Victor's tried to make some sense of it by interpreting it as a deer. And Mix made the point that future work here may still reveal a prehistoric site under the Christian one. So, all right, maybe we haven't found one of Connor's palaces, but you never know, maybe some 11th century monk, when he was writing his part of the Toyn, saw Navan Mound and saw Hohi's Fort and saw some ruins here, and that was the inspiration that led him to write the part of the story that said that Connor had three palaces. You never know. Thank you.